very good morning to everyone. I thought I'd get up very, very early on this Easter morning to be the first to wish you a happy Easter. And you know what? All things are alive during this lockdown. There's noisy birds all around the vicarage and a little fox watching uh, the bird feeds, looking for something to kill, really. And, uh, and because of him, uh, a little mouse... Um, waiting to go out. Uh, how can they be so hideously fast uh, when they're so tiny mice? Uh, but anyhow, I know how to edit videos on iMovie now, so let's proceed. Um, this Easter sermon might be a little more, shall we say, demanding than usual because it's written in the belief that you will have a lot of time to chew over it. Um, but first, uh, an, an old joke for you to dispel the gloom. I mean, a really, really old joke. It was written centuries ago in Old Irish, in Goidelic. And just in case you happen to speak Old Irish, I've included the text both on the website and on the blog. Three holy men once turned their back to the world and they went into the wilderness to atone for their sins before God. They did not speak to one another for a whole year. And at the end of that year, one of them spoke up and said, Aren't we doing well? And another year went by the same way. Amen. Yes, we are, said the next hermit. And so another year went by. I swear by my smock said the third man. If you two won't be still, I'm going to leave you both here in the wilderness. We're all hermits at the moment, in a way. Although we do not live in the desert physically, our interaction with other people is curtailed quite significantly, and many of us suffer because of this. Isolation is not an easy thing. It is, after all, a form of punishment in its more extreme forms. Uh, solitary confinement, for instance, for more than a fortnight is considered a form of torture by the United Nations. It has measurable physiological and psychological consequences, and you can actually be brought to trial for inflicting it unlawfully. Now, we're isolating ourselves for a time because we're trying to contain a pandemic, as we all know. Quite a few, even among us, have raised their voices to criticise the churches at this time, but to a point I think we should try to understand and to forgive. Um, everyone can be forgiven for not having a handle on this. Governments, medics, researchers and churches too, because nothing like this has ever happened before. We've had killer viruses, of course, to be sure, but not in this age of mass travel and of very easy mobility. So we have to stay put, we have to stay home, and it's difficult. It's boring, it's unpleasant in so many ways, but it's also a great spiritual opportunity. And Christians throughout the ages have longed for this. Some even went to extremes to isolate themselves and to seek after God. Uh, monks and nuns and hermits, of course, but not only them. Our Lord frequently withdrew to pray. Uh, he even used to go into hiding to do so. And he did this often too, if St Luke's Gospel is to be believed. Checked. He, check his fifth chapter, verse 16. The very first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark says that in the morning, while it was still very dark, he used to go up to deserted places by himself, and there he prayed. And so well hidden could he sometimes be that Simon and his companions had to hunt for him, 
the word in the Greek Gospels is really hunt, katadioko, katadioksan. They had to trail him as you would a little deer or a fox. So self-isolation has divine precedence and it shouldn't all be bad for those who try to follow Christ. Hermits are not just loners or people whose vices and foibles are, shall we say, less sociable than others. There is great strength in solitude because you cannot find Christ as you would say a long lost set of keys, a misplaced set of keys. You can't find Christ as you would find the solution to a problem, even a very difficult problem, or yet discover something you never knew existed in the first place. Christ cannot be found outside and any objective idea of him is false. That is to say, any concept of him as an object, as something out there that can be described accurately. Sure, some people claim to have visions of him, but, and I'll say this brutally, not two of their visions are alike, and they cannot therefore be true. I'm with Bishop Butler and with traditional Anglican doctrine on this matter uh, when John Wesley was field preaching in his diocese way back in uh, the centuries. Bishop Butler took him to task, famously telling him, Sir, the pretending to extraordinary revelations or gifts of the Holy Ghost is a horrid thing, a very horrid thing. Saint Paul famously had a vision of Christ, but you know the experience left him very puzzled indeed and blind to boot. Um, pondering his experience some 14 years afterwards, he wrote this. I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I still do not know. Only God knows. And I know that such a man, again, whether in the body or not, I cannot tell, such a man was caught up into paradise and heard things that cannot be uttered, that no mortal is able to repeat. So there we have it from the mouth of an apostle, no less. He only got caught up to the third heaven and there were supposed to be seven, and he was left unable to speak about it. He even added that to keep him from being too proud about this, a thorn was given to him in the flesh, and three times he begged the Lord to be rid of it. But the Lord said to him, Paul, my grace is sufficient to you, because power is made perfect in weakness. So like him, let us boast all the more gladly in our weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in us. That was in the second letter to the Corinthians, the 12th chapter, by the way. Christ cannot be found outside. His kingdom cannot be found outside. The kingdom of God is within. It's a bit like... Um, a bit like the error pages on failed Google searches, they tend to display messages that say, oops, sorry, there is nothing here. Well, no, um, there is something there. There is an error page with all sorts of links to other things and a message saying that there is nothing there. And by that, they mean not the thing you were looking for. Just so, God will not conform to what we are looking for, and if we search for him with preconceived ideas and pictures and notions, we will hit the error page. Again, when we read the stories of those who saw the risen Christ, we inescapably come to the conclusion that all of them were surprised, all of them. 
the pilgrims of Emmaus were utterly oblivious to his presence till the Christ himself opened their eyes as they broke bread together, but before that they could not recognise him. Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener, as we all know. Thomas famously refused to believe the other ten all were mistaken. And besides this, their direct experience of someone they had known in real life is not available to us anymore. And if they were surprised, we cannot expect our preconceived notions of someone we never knew in the flesh to come true. Words and concepts cannot guide us. And this is where the wisdom of the hermits can be found. You can find Christ right where you are, but you have to become Christ-like yourself to do so. You must allow him to be born in you. Any other idea of him is to a large extent false. It is a creation of your own mind. It is something, something that needs to die so that Christ can reveal himself. Again, as Paul wrote, you must die with him so that it is no longer you who lives, but Christ in you. That's Galatians 2.19. And silence in your ally in this endeavour, and isolation too. Physical silence, of course, but also silence of the heart and of the mind. Silence that does away with fears and with solitude. And again, there's a little Monty Python sketch about Frank the Hermit. Um, who's a bad hermit, who, who happens a, across another monk. I've, I've included the link on the website because it's very funny and we could all do with a bit of fun at the moment. And if Frank the Hermit doesn't do it for you, one of the desert mothers, um, Syncletica of Alexandria, if you must know her name, she put it very well. You can be a hermit in a huge crowd, and you can be a worldling in the middle of the desert, lost in the crowd of your own thoughts. Syncletica had been a real beauty in her youth, apparently, and she'd taken over the family business once her parents had died. She's one of the very few rich, beautiful business women who had it all in late antiquity. Um, and she sold everything and lived in the Egyptian desert for decades. And she wrote, You can be a hermit in the busy city of Alexandria, and you can be worldly in the desert, but lost in your own chit-chat and dreams and delusions. So here's my little advice for these unpleasant times. Embrace isolation for a little while and pay attention to a whole world you may otherwise never notice. The risen Christ will meet you in seclusion as he met the disciples in seclusion in the upper room when all the doors were shut. He can meet you in the garden as he met Mary there on her own. He can meet you at table as he met the pilgrims of Emmaus who journeyed away from the hustle and bustle of